ideology, right? With product placement, uh, advertisements, uh, even in times when you think that you're engaging in something that's deeply personal, like say on social media, it's not a deeply personal thing, <laughs> right? Uh, you're actually consuming it, right? You're, you're making money for a corporation. You're, uh, you're, you're allowing them to gather data about you, right? It is it's something that in that moment that's deeply personal is actually a consumer behavior, you know, at its finest. And I think of uh, in the, the classic idea of conspicuous consumption, right? Uh, which captures this idea that we don't just buy commodities to use them, but to be seen using them. And this captures the idea of the melding of culture and economics into a kind of ideology of consumerism. And so that's the, uh, the, the problem there uh, that's being laid out um, in his book and how to imagine how to go beyond that very powerful ideology that affects all of us to think the total world order of things, right? Um, and so one of the things that I've been looking at obviously is climate fiction, but I don't wanna to say too much about that today. Uh, I have a class on that in the spring term. I put a, a plug for that here. Uh, my, it's my second one. Um, <laughs> um, but um, I wanted to talk about documentaries. And I think documentaries are a very powerful kind of medium that can capture the global world order and deal with climate change in a very meaningful way. Um, and I have two examples for you. Uh, students that have taken classes with me will know these examples because I've used them many times. But uh, uh, the documentary, The Story of Stuff from 2007, which was done by Annie Leonard, a filmmaker at the time, and now she's the executive director of Greenpeace USA. It's just a 20 minute documentary. It's a mixture of animation and, and, and basically her as a talking head in front of the animation. But it completely outlines what she calls the materials economy, from extraction to production, to distribution, to consumption, and to disposal. And, and while she's doing this with these very simple graphics, she's essentially laying out the global economy and then pointing out along the way the injustices at every single step of the way, and then pointing out the unsustainability of it, right? This linear process of production. Uh, and she even makes the point at one point that if everybody lived on the earth the way that each of us live in the modern world economy or in the modern parts of the economy, uh, you would need three to five Earths to, to do it, right? It's literally unsustainable. Uh, um, and so it's a really powerful thing. And she gets to the point uh, where she actually talks about how it's represented in the media. <laughs> and, and she very much emphasizes the idea that uh, uh, it's uh, the representations of it are consumer representations of it, right? Caught up in the network of marketing and things of that sort. Uh, so it's a really fantastic documentary, I think. And it's a good example of trying to imagine um, the totality of our moment. Uh, another good example is a documentary that came out in 2018, a Canadian documentary called uh, Anthrop uh, Anthropocene, the Human Epoch. Uh, the Anthropocene, of course, is the, this new geological term. I don't think they've finally confirmed it yet, but it's, there's been much discussion about it, uh, about whether or not we've entered a new age in the geological era uh, that's characterized by the massive impact of human beings on the environment around the globe. Um, but this is a movie that would be best seen on an IMAX screen. Uh, it's incredibly cinematic, incredibly visual, and it lets the images do the talking. And it takes you around the world, literally from continent to continent. And it shows you that materials economy that Annie Litter talks about, the actual places, the extraction sites, the mining facilities, the, the coal power, uh, coal, coal powered uh, electrical plants, right? All around the world, uh, the landfill areas, um, lithium being mined over here, you know, coal over here. And you really get this global sense of the economy, right? Uh, and how all these countries are globally connected together in the production of things. Um, and, uh, uh, and of course, the, the theme running through it is the unsustainableness of the economy. Um, so I, I think of these as both companion pieces. I think the first one is really does a good job of sketching out the global order. And then the, the, the second one fleshes it out with really concrete material images. But they're startling. And when, you're, when, when you watch that documentary, you realize that unless you live next to 
a landfill or live next to, you know, a mining facility or, or an oil field or something like that. You've never seen these images before, right? <laughs> You've never seen them before. Um, so I, I take a lot of hope from documentaries as effective new media that uh, deal with climate change in ways that are realistic and imaginative and persuasive. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to use the time that I have today to make a kind of book recommendation. It's actually a book that uh, Dr. Lewis recommended to me shortly after it came out in the fall of uh, 2020, I believe, um, and which I've thought a lot about since. Uh, and in fact, it, written a, a chapter for a forthcoming Cambridge Companion about it. Uh, and today, we released a, a podcast from the Center for Mark Twain Studies uh, with a sort of diverse quartet of scholars also talking about this book. It, but before I talk about the book specifically, I wanted to sort of draw upon what Dr. Lewis said about the extent to which mass media is complicit in climate change. I think in part through the narratives that it habituates in us, right? Uh, and the example I give many, those of you who have had me in class, this may be a sort of familiar claim, right? But I, I frequently argue that the apocalypse, right? The apocalyptic moment, the post-apocalyptic dystopian era, right? These are narratives, both fictive and historical, that are most familiar to US audiences. Right? And that has been the case. It has been escalating, amplifying uh, ever since the, uh, you know, the, it, ever since the dropping of the bomb in 1945. Right? And very clearly though, for a long time, right? Through much of the mid 20th century, the eschatology, the apocalyptic was a specifically nuclear imaginary. Right. It has since taken on many different forms, uh, and most recently, most specifically, right, of ecological or environmental apocalypse, of climate apocalypse. Right? And our comfort with, our habituation in these narratives right, can be dangerous. Right? Uh, they elicit usually one of two common audience responses, would both of which I think are equally corrosive. One is resignation, right? That we cannot control what's coming, right? That it is, uh, it is beyond the capacity of any individual or any institution or any single nation to stop the onslaught, the onset, right? And so we just have to sort of brace ourselves. And you think about something like the recent film, Don't Look Up is a great example of that kind of resignation, right? We, you know, we don't have the institutions, we don't have the human nature, right? In order to come together and do what it would take to uh, alleviate climate change. And the other common response is romanticization, right? is that what will happen after the horrors of some form of climate apocalypse is that new societies will take shape that are healthier, simpler. Right? I think about something like The Walking Dead as exemplary of this, right? That the communities that take shape after the zombie apocalypse are presumed to be ones in which different sets of skills, different types of education, right? Different identities will be embraced and rewarded. And as horrific as some of the things that the people who survive will have to go through, right? that certainly one of the things that audience do is they imagine the ways in which that world might be better. Right? which I think is deeply delusional. Right? Uh, and so one of the things that, that I think is a project for culture makers, taste makers, right? for literary critics and artists and writers, right? is to practice imagining futures that include civilization, right? that include humanity, that include more than just a survivalist clinging to bare life. But these uh, imaginaries also have to reckon with the current momentum towards catastrophe, towards cataclysm, towards apocalypse. Right? And the novel that I wanted to talk about today is, is an example of something that I think does that well, right? That uh, Ministry for the Future, 
right? It, one of the things that I really enjoyed about this, it begins with one of the most harrowing scenes that I have ever read. Right? It begins by describing the onset of a heat wave in India that kills tens of millions of people, right? So I don't want to, uh, you know, claim that this is all, uh, you know, pleasantry, right? But after that harrowing scene, right, it shows us that there are strategies available of, to us to avoid the worst case scenarios, right? It reminds us, right, that this, these are not problems without solutions. In fact, the science and the technology are already there. Right. What we need is the capacity to lever those things, right? to create collective, collaborative, coordinated responses across borders and boundaries. And there are really great ideas for doing that. Right? It's all about implementation. Right? And one of the beautiful things about this book is it shows that possibility. Right? It lays out a version of what the next 30 years can look like, at the end of which Many, in many ways, people around the world are better off than they are now, right? Not only does the worst thing not happen, right? Not only do we not face a true climate apocalypse, a mass extinction event, but actually things like inequality are reduced, right? Actually things like black markets and crime right? and human trafficking, right? These things are corrected, right? Shows the ways in which all many of the problems that we face as a society are interrelated, right? And that by solving one problem, we often end up doing work to solve other problems. Right. And so one of the things I love about this novel is it does it it has a clear eyed vision of the, you know, the stakes. Right. But it also has a kind of hopeful way of looking to the future and imagining a world that is realistic, that is possible. Right. Uh, and shows us a way that we might be able to get there. Right? One of the things and appropriate to this panel, appropriate to the, uh, you know, the whole event today. One of the things that is crucial to that program, that project in Ministry for the Future is not just the erosion of boundaries in terms of the flow of, uh, of money, of capital, of people, right? Uh, a kind of reduction of uh, national uh, and ethnic entrenchments, but also a reduction of boundaries between disciplines. Right? Uh, that very specifically, Kim Stanley Robinson, the author, says that, yes, the climate science is there, right? The science is there, the technology is there, the engineering is there, but engineers and climate scientists will not get there, will not get there by themselves, right? That they need other practitioners. And specifically, he points to two groups of people, economists and critical theorists, right? That is cultural theorists, humanities professors, as he oftentimes calls them, right? uh, that the project of reducing carbon emissions is one that requires us not only to be able to be practiced in the persuasion and the political strategy that will be necessary, right? but it also imagine, it forces us to sort of erect imaginaries, erect models that are not purely quantitative, that are not purely scientific, right? that involve a sort of broad understanding of media, Right? of art, of history, of the ways in which narrative works. Right? And he makes it very, very clear right, that without the participation of artists and tastemakers and culture makers and critics and specifically theorists, this is impossible. Right? Uh, and that I think for us is a lesson about broad education. Right, that particular to uh, an event like today, this, is a, this novel offers us a reminder that there is a tendency, a temptation to silo ourselves, right? To say, I'm, you know, I'm a literary critic. What I care about is reading novels and reading poems, right? Or I'm a engineer. What I care about is building, uh, you know, building stuff, right? And, or I'm an economist. And what I ca care about is designing models based upon microeconomic foundations, right? Like, <laughs> 
there is a very, very strong tendency within the academy, right? And not only within the academy, right? To say, pick a major, pick a discipline, pick a subfield, pick a research project, right? Uh, and become a specialist, right? Get really, really good at that one thing, that very limited understanding of the world. And I understand that temptation. I've been part of it myself, right? but it's hurting us. Right? And one of the things that this novel really emphasizes is that we have to break out of that. We have to start believing again in broad, general, liberal arts or education, if that's what you want to call it, right? A sense that every part of human endeavor, right? Whether it is math, right? Whether it is biology, whether it is mass media, right? Uh, is part of this project. And, and we have to have some sort of foundational knowledge in many of those things. We have to have shared vocabularies, right? shared sets of priors, shared understanding of the incentive structures, shared understandings of what's at stake in order for us to have any hope right? of realizing this very possible, very accessible, very imaginable future in which we don't have mass extinction and we don't have apocalypse. Right? So that's my recommendation is, you know, Read this book. <laughs> and you can if you take my climate fiction class <laughs> in the spring term. <laughs> All right, I just want to make sure everybody can hear because my mask, if you in the back can't hear, I'm okay. Oh, turn the mic. All right, to, uh, to make sure that I didn't go too long or too short, I've sort of written a few things out, so bear with me. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is very much connected to how we work with students at Elmira College. So some of you will uh, be part of this discussion. Um, starting with FYS, uh, some students may have been in Derek Chalhant's class, Art Design and Ecology. And I'm going to let him probably talk more about that. But I basically said that they were discussing issues and artworks created by people who try to bring climate change awareness through exhibitions of their work in museums, galleries, and he just said to me in Times Square, so we'll talk about that. Uh, we had an exhibition in the fall called Coastal Collage Project 10 in the George Waters Gallery, and the FYS classes uh, that the three art professors took those classes to the gallery. The uh, exhibition included collages from all over the world that used recycled materials. We in the art department brought uh, the three groups together and I'm looking right at Jay, it's one of my students who was there. Um, and uh, I gave a little bit of a lecture about how artists often when they're using collage have political messages. And those political messages of course could be about immigration, uh, racial justice, but in this case, we'll say climate change. Uh, these, uh, this show in the George Waters Gallery was collected with our classes creating their own collages of recycled materials. So they, uh, Derek and I had our, our students uh, show work at the uh, Connecticut Library and Chris Longwell's students were shown in the term uh, uh, two show in January. And some of our work is downtown at City Hall right now. Um, the other thing I would like to say is that uh, uh, we've been always working with this concept for uh, as long as I've been here, I've been here probably longer than anybody in this room. Uh, we have classes that routinely are connected to the earth, such as Chris Longwell's ceramics classes where he is working with clay, water, fire, and air. And that must ring a bell to some humanities people, if not science people. Aaron Caper's drawing class, uh, the drawing from nature, exa examine the natural world and often discover uh, the effects of climate change such as uh, invasive species. One of the uh, most uh, beautiful trees in this part of New York has been decimated and that's the ash tree by the emerald ash borer. My, uh, for myself, I'm just going to talk about a class called Digital Studio Art Without Borders. This week, um, well, before I talk about what we did this week, if you're in the library, you would have known that they have put artwork up in the uh, library uh, lobby showcases on climate change. We 
planned out right before break and they worked on it over break. So some of it is artwork that they made. I told them they could appropriate from a uh, website that had all kinds of photos of all the places all over the world that have evidence of the effects of climate change. So if you haven't looked at that, that will be up for a little longer. Uh, the, this week in the class, we were talking about three artists, Elfer Eliasson, who's from Iceland, he's Danish Icelandic artist, Gabriel Orozco of Mexico, and Chris Jordan, who I believe, even though he lives in South America, in Chile, I believe he's an American, and he uh, um, has a little bit different uh, artwork as well, because this is a film. I had my students write about what, what they looked at, read about, and I'm just gonna quote from a few of them. So the first one is Carrie Jensen, and she says, I think that Eliasson's work with the ice from glaciers really helps to visualize the impact we have on the changing climate. You can talk about the ice caps melting and the glaciers melting, but because we don't physically see it, it is out of sight, out of mind for many of us. With this exhibit, you can physically see the impact. You are able to visualize what is happening because it's right in front of you and it shows that these things are actually happening and are taking a big toll on the environment. Second artist, Jordan's film, you are able to see the impact humans have despite not actually being physically present in the area. On Midway Island, you see thousands and thousands of birds living and raising their babies and flourishing on the land. Then it shows pictures of what is going on inside the birds. Their stomachs are filled with plastic and other garbage like lighters and bottle caps. The trash is obviously coming from humans having no regard for anyone but themselves. And not even realizing that they're taking toll on other species. We are not physically inhabiting the island, but we are still causing the wildlife to suffer because of our disregard to the trash we are making. Nursing major Karina Gibbs goes on to say on Chris Jordan's Midway film, it proved that the issue of pollution has become so widespread and uncontrolled that we are now polluting uninhabited islands and areas around the world. The fact that this island is more than 2000 miles from any continent and yes, is still being destroyed by our trash is certainly a heartbreaking and unsettling sight to see. This film appeals to the sense of pity we feel since these animals are being killed by our pollution and are unable to know the difference between trash and food. The third artist is Gabrielle Orozco and she writes about him. And I think this is interesting what she writes because it's sort of um, looking at it, it addresses I think what Matt was talking about a little bit. Orozco addresses the issues and consequences of pollution in a way that is very unlike the previous two artists he transforms these pieces of everyday garbage into an appealing visual display. This is very impressive in my opinion, since most people would not think to take these pieces of trash and turn them into art and have them be placed in the Guggenheim in Berlin. It is, interest, it is an interesting method of addressing the pollution issue. However, I believe that this artwork in a way romanticizes the idea of pollution since it is being displayed in such a organized manner and the consequences of pollution are not mentioned within the artwork itself. Art major Alex Taylor says, these three artists through their creative and strategical messages about consumerism, human aspects and the results of our actions may finally prove to society that what is happening in this world can be all traced back to the way humans treat the planet. Forget the sign saying, save the planet and forget the politicians saying, these are the numbers. Show anyone an installation piece or a film such as these and the viewer will be sure to at least listen and give the idea a chance. We count on these artists in the art world to present the realities of life through visual and artistic mediums in hopes to grab the attention of society and show them that just what is happening around us. And I'm gonna end with Gran Danone he says, the effects of global warming are much more serious than we believe. Thanks to the art world, there are individuals who are taking the initiative to induce, introduce these troubling environmental issues to the world with unique ways of portraying these messages. Surely at some point, it will sink into the human's minds that we need to change the way we are living. And I think Derek will, 
go segue into that because his what he's going to talk about addresses this. Uh, hopefully, uh, one thing I could ask, uh, I, I think um, Professor Browning asked if we could at least have one question for the audience or for the panelists here. And one question I would have for, for everyone here would be, if it wouldn't be too uncomfortable for you, unless you have certain restrictions, leave your phone uh, by itself for a little while and tune in to us because if we're not all here together, how can we be here together? Okay, so if that makes you a little uncomfortable, maybe that's a good thing, okay? so. If nothing else, maybe you'll remember that, but the, the discomfort of having somebody maybe call you out a little bit. So um, what I have to say is, is written here, it's in books. Um, I guess one thing I could imagine if I was in your seat, but I'm sitting in a chair pretty much like yours, just a few, few years older, is what can I do to make a difference? What can I do to make a change? And then, oh, we have a week long competition and who wins is re recycling. We, we, we've, we've seen recycling bins since we were kids, okay? Maybe not for me, but for you all. And it might seem a little trivial, you know, trivial, trivial or, or topical. Um, and as Jay was saying earlier before the start of the day, one person, you know, what can you do to make a difference? But if everyone does some little thing that adds up to larger things that can make a difference. So I'm going to go back a little bit in time to when I was in grad school and one of my uh, very influential professors, Dr. Craig Adcock, who was a, a Duchampian or Marcel Duchamp scholar. And um, that was a little bit beyond my thinking at the time, but I, I, I have great respect for what he shared with me and, and the rest of my, my uh, peers at that moment in time is, is uh, it, it, they introduced us to uh, conceptual art and one artist that I got assigned to, we all had, were given contemporary artists to do research on. And this is way, way before uh, internet and cell phones came. So I'll date myself happily, but I was given an artist Mel Chen to do research on. So I actually wrote Mel Chen by envelope, uh, US mail. He gave me a thick packet back of exhibition, copies, catalogs and things like that. I said, hey, this guy looks pretty, like, pretty interesting things. And I was used to artists having a certain look or style to, to a, like work or at least a body work. And initially I was like, this guy's all over the place. But then after looking at one of his pieces called Revival Field, I'm like, wow, this guy's really smart. But then I realized it wasn't just that one artist, Mel Chin, who made the work. This artist, Mel Chin, collaborated with botanists, chemists, scientists. And what they did is they came up with um, these plants called hyperaccumulators. And the hyperaccumulators essentially were planted in a place in uh, Minnesota, Pig's Eye, Minnesota. And there was a, a very nasty toxic waste dump there. Basically, humans couldn't enter. It was uninhabitable. It was actually fenced off, uh, barbed wire fence, industrial fencing. And so Mel Chen came up with the design, made this huge proposal. And so they came up with these hyperaccumulator plants which were planted in the soil and it actually extracted heavy metals, cadmium, lead, and zinc. And once the plants extracted the heavy metals, they were carefully, properly incinerated. The heavy metals could then be collected and that metal could be reused and repurposed. Hence then returning this area, this land into reusable land, okay? This was back in the, uh, uh, 1991, I believe. Um, that, it was just a, a thought that Mel had. And as an artist, he didn't have the means himself to come up with all the particulars. He didn't have a scientific background. So he collaborated with people who were experts in the field, much like my colleagues here are suggesting we need to come together, pull up the tape that divides us between this major and that major and this career and that career and, 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 and come together and problem solve. And, and I'm thinking about, life expectancy, this is, I'm gonna say, this is more your world than, than, than ours up here. So you all have in some way, the challenge of pressure and the luxury of collaborating, not just with yourselves, but people from all over the world. You know, we're a global society. We're a click away from people who have the knowledge that we need to, to realize that dream and to maybe transform land or transform an idea and something that can be applied that maybe benefits everybody. The, re the revival field is just a model. Now that model has been applied to all kinds of places all over the world. 
And it's, it's expanded into something that Mel Chen initially had no idea uh, that was gonna happen. Um, another project Mel Chen did was, um, anybody been to Times Square before, have heard of it? So Times Square uh, 2015 would sound like, well, that's a long time ago. So he did this piece called Mooring, um, M-O-O-R-I-N-G. And essentially what it was is participants or visitors ideally would have 3D uh, virtual glasses on. And when they looked around, essentially it, they, they got the sense that they were underwater because it's predicted that by 2100, Times Square at least will be under six feet of water. And as I, my research says, it's probably gonna be a little bit more no matter what kind of fence they put in and big sponge in the ocean. So um, that was not your typical exhibition in a museum. So one interest that I have in my own research is, is how do you get you know, the public more in tune, maybe become more aware, become more conscious about really what's going on besides your news app or something else is if you can make art more accessible to the public and remove it from the galleries to a, a big spot like Times Square it has you know, millions of visitors per year that can make a, a very impactful, um, you know, perhaps response from, from visitors, especially people who don't really go there anticipating to be you know, flooded with, with these concepts and this beautiful, um, as apocalyptic as it may seem, the scene, so to speak, and they're actually, they're, they become a part of, a lot of times we go into a museum and gallery and the arts on the wall are on a pedestal and we're there to view it, where Mel Chen places us, the visitor viewer, and we become active participants. So he's really calling us to you know, be aware of, like we are participants, we can't just be bystanders and wait for somebody to come along and you know, wave the magic wand and make, make us you know, turn into some, some fairy tale kind of setting. So. Um, I think going back to some of my, my earlier years in grad school, um, my eyes were wide open after I got a hold of some of Mel, Chen, Mel Chen's work. So uh, if you walk away with anything today, check out Mel Chen's work. Uh, another, uh, not a book per se, but something that's maybe more easily accessible to some degree, it's free, um, that I've shared with some episodes uh, in my FYS classes is... Uh, Years of Living Dangerously. It's a National Geographic's documentary based. They have various episodes with all kinds of celebrities. And essentially they go around the world talking about real kind of uh, uh, things that are going on that aren't directly affecting us, we think, but they actually are. And they touch on topics from the migration that's happening as the middle of Africa, the temperatures are, are, you know, are rising annually that's causing essentially a mass exodus because if food can't grow in the middle of Africa, the people more often than not, they're traveling north. Well, you get this influx of people traveling north and the people up north feel like they're taking over in their territory because then they're cutting in on their food source. And so we as American uh, citizens, if we will, and anybody who's uh, studying from abroad, at least you're here now, um, we've seen in the past several years, people from all of the world, even recently people of Ukraine find an easier route coming from Mexico into the United States. So um, the things that I've been influenced by from, from Mel Chen, Years of Living Dangerously and, and other things impact my own art. So even if you're not necessarily an art major, your employers now, one of the buzzwords they're gonna ask you in a, or have their highlighted in a job description, it's gonna be creative, innovative thinkers. And if you're not that, go to the end of the line or find some other job. So I'm just saying, all of you, you're asked to be creative individual thinkers. If your current professors aren't including that in their course syllabi, they're probably mentioning it in their classrooms. If not, your future employers now more than ever are gonna be asking you to problem solve and figure things out. And that's what you're getting paid for. So I'm not here to convert everybody into being art majors or minors. If you are, you could sign up today. <laughs> but it's 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 now more than ever. I'm just saying, if if you haven't heard it yet, you're hearing it today, and you're going to hear it down the pipe. And remember, it doesn't matter who told you. It's just it's it's part of our culture now. So. Um, I can say that in my own artistic development evolution, I've become more thoughtful. My work is in some ways become a little bit more conceptual. 
um, as, as Jan mentioned too, in, in my courses, I do talk about sustainability. My, my basic sculpture class, we're doing uh, repurposing upcycled, recycled, possibly wearable art piece. And in years past, Jan and my colleagues, Chris uh, and, and others have been a part of, we've had like kind of like a, a recycled runway. Um, that's something that we may be stoking up in, in the near future. So um, some more things to think about. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I mean, what's left to say, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so I just wanted, I don't want to talk that long. We, the panel doesn't have that much more. I would love to hear more from you guys, to be honest, but um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of threads that have already come up. And, and one of them is just the interdisciplinariness of all the work that we're pointing to and the work that we actually do. And I think in some ways, arts and humanities kind of tends to already be interdisciplinary. And, you know, this session, this day is about finding solutions. And I just think that um, each one of the examples that we've pulled out, and I, I had a couple of examples to show, to, to bring to the table, but I'm not sure I wanna talk about those quite yet. Um, I think where Dr. Lewis started us was in, you know, defining the problem as a problem of culture and a problem of imagination. And part of that is understanding that we're all connected, right? Yes. And we're we're kind of all in this together. And I think that art and media um, just kind of naturally has a way of demonstrating how we are connected. You can't have any, you can't do art without technology. You can't have media without technology already but somehow some some parts of that get hidden and i think it's important for us to remember that the work that we do kind of all needs both of those things um one of the the books that i wanted to bring up today is not a book of literature it's actually kind of a book that crosses genres which i think is fitting for what we're talking about um it's an it's an it's a nonfiction book it's kind of part memoir part scientific uh, treatise in part like nature writing and it's it's called braiding sweetgrass and some of you might have actually read it because I think it's on the syllabus of at least one class here at Elmira College um, and it's written by Robin Wall Kimmerer and she's a professor of environmental and forest um, biology um, she's also the director for the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment at SUNY College of Environmental um, science and forestry, um, and she's a she's a she's an indigenous person. She's she's a scientist who brings indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge together, and I think that's what's so fascinating about her work and her kind of mission. Um, and she has this really interesting anecdote kind of early on in the book that I just wanted to share. Um, I didn't want to quote the whole passage. But she goes to college, so she's grown up. She's decided that she loves, she loves flowers, basically. Like she's young, she loves flowers. She's learning about the indigenous practices of being a relationship with the land. And she has had this question since she was little that there are these two flowers, and I didn't actually write them down, and I'm so bad at flower names. But um, there's these two flowers. Has anyone read that book? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Has anyone read Sweet Grass? Brains are good. Do you know what the two flowers? <laughs> yes, right? Yeah. So wasn't that a fascinating chapter? Okay, so what's also, I think, really cool is that what are the colors of the flowers? Purple and gold, right? <laughs> so that these two flowers, and they grow together, right? They grow together in the wild. And as she's growing up, she's like, why do these two flowers always grow together? And why are they so beautiful? We have purple and gold and somehow their colors come together and it's so beautiful. And she like grows up and she's like, I wanna be a botanist. I wanna be a scientist because I wanna learn about the beauty of these flowers, right? And so she gets to college and she's registering for classes and she has her advisor, right? Like something that you guys all do. She meets her advisor who's the advisor in botany or biology or whatever. And he's asking her, you know, what she's interested in and what classes she wants to take. And she starts saying, you know, she mentions, um, well, I'm really, you know, I wanna, you know, explore the beauty of these flowers. And this, 
this professor who is not like any of the professors we have here, I'm sure, just kind of <coughs> shot her dreams down because he says something like, oh, if you wanna study beauty, you should go be an art major. You shouldn't be a biology major. And she was like, what? <laughs> because um, she was basically told that beauty and science are two different worlds. And the irony was that it was literally beauty that brought her to science, right? right. And so that, I don't know if you, have you already read that part? Like that was so moving to me. And I think one thing that she does over and over again in this book is she shows how there's, there's multiple worlds that we, that we actually are always navigating it, whether it's science and art, whether it's indigenous and, you know, Western science and Western thinking, right? And it's when we can bring these things together that we have the most potential for growth and we have the most potential for actually learning something and changing something, right? Because that professor, he was like, had already shut down. Like, I'm not gonna learn anything about this other world. And he had kind of been stuck there, but you know what? I think she's gone further with her career because she was thinking about the multi-dimensions of the planet, right? And our relationship with that planet takes understanding all the different ways we relate to it. Um, so I, I don't know what the moral of my story is today, but I think it's just about thinking about what are the, what are the ways that you already think that you're bringing different worlds together? Because one of the things that we do at Elmira College is we do have a, we bring liberal, liberal arts education together. We have professionalism and liberal arts that, that, are, that come together. So everyone leaves Elmira College with this kind of rich experience of arts and sciences and professional pre preparation. And so I guess my question is, I mean, we don't have that much time left, but I guess my question is, you know, how are you thinking that you might bring different parts of your education that you're getting here at Elmira College? How are you going to bring those together to have a wider picture of what your role in the world is, right? Because is your role just to be whatever your profession is? Like, there is no just one thing. There is never just one pathway, right, that we're all going to walk. We have to we have to keep our blinders off, right? And I think that's something that all the art and media that we've been talking about today is talking about, is about making sure we're taking our blinders off, right? Um, so like, I just have a question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so like, you know, I'm an environmental science major, and the reason why I've gotten into environmental science is because I just have like so much love for the environment and different things that want to do, um, like how, like going into the workforce and like going through like my college musical experience, how do I like rethink, or how do I like, keep all of us rethink like the beauty that we just like, saw in science and just like how we probably do that as an <laughs> art and what advice would you have? I mean, so I'm gonna say first and foremost, don't uh, don't limit yourself to that definition, right? Like you, you know, I I'll, I'll give you an example, right? That uh, I, as an undergraduate, I was a major in English and American studies. These are two very conventionally paired majors. Uh, they were, you know, were setting me up in a very direct way to go to graduate school to become a professor. That was what I wanted to do, so on and so forth. However, I can say that nothing has been more important to my career than a relatively random event, which is I started reading economics after I graduated. Right? And nothing has contributed more to the, you know, to, to the success that I have had than that random choice right, that I made to explore this third field that has acted in many ways as a catalyst, right? To use the kind of scientific metaphor, right? There were these two things I was doing that lots of people were doing. I added this third thing that nobody was doing, right? And that that was very, very useful to me for, a, you know, at the time uh, when I was in graduate school and then, you know, going on the job market, a very difficult job, 
right? And I think that's one of the things I would definitely recommend to say is don't, you know, don't get yourself set in a silo, right? Where this is what I am. I'm an environmental scientist. I'm an engineer, right? Like there are so many different ways to catalyze the things that you're most interested in with things that you might not have realized were possible. Now is a good time to open for any questions you guys might have. What, like, what is the beauty? What is that you're talking about? So, like, what do you think you'll lose in the future that you have right now? Okay. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I, I think that just your your hope and the fact that you're already aware that there's this beauty that you're after. Um, just keep it just like, you know, Professor Kimmerer um, did, like she didn't, that professor could have totally like um, dampened her, her spirits, but she didn't let it, you know what I mean? Like she, she went back and found the people or she found the communities that, sh that she could continue learning from. Yeah. So that's the other part. So like, don't, don't shut yourself down to continuing to learn. I think that's what, right. prof you know, Professor um, Seabald's point is, right? Yeah. That like, even when you're done with your degree, like you need to keep looking. Like we're still, like we're all seekers, right? Like we wouldn't be in this room if we weren't seeking something. Right. So just keep that, I mean, keep that going. And that's, I mean, the beauty of it, seeking itself might be beauty. Like the unknown is depressing and scary, but it's also a maybe there's some beauty there. Why I think that I'm trying to take and so to do probably because that people want don't see the beauty around them or they like just it's too late and they refuse to like yeah. continue learning and they like yeah think that this is it and everything's so static. Yeah. Um, one, one artist, uh, since we're artists here, uh, to, to look up maybe there's an artist, Alan Sonfist, okay, S-O-N-F-I-S-T. Um, in Indianapolis, he on the main north and south road that divides the city in half, east to west, is Meridian Street. He was commissioned to plant wildflowers in the front lawn of a mansion. And this whole Meridian Street is lined with uh, uh, former governor's mansion and, and current governor's mansion. So these are like multi-million dollar homes. You can imagine wildflowers popping up at some front lawn when everybody else has this tightly manicured French sort of chateau look. And there was there was a major petition, like there was an uproar about this. And, and Alan Sonfis got a huge government grant to plant flowers in these art collector's house. Well, he started a trend that his definition of beauty clash with the neighbors and then all of a sudden the neighbors their backyards were wildflowers they didn't want to buy in that quickly so you know it, if if whatever you define as beauty just continue, i would just say continue to pursue that whatever that is and that that may change as professor you know dr siebel was talking about adding in economics and so you i would imagine that you'll continue to add other sort of arsenal to your palette to, that embellishes that beauty whatever that is you know? There's various moments in your life where you're going to be tempted to feel like this is over, right? Like I'm done. I completed my degree, right? I got the job I want. Like my, you know, the, the, the skills, the bodies of knowledge, the work has been done and now I can go ahead and live my life, right? And I encourage you to always resist that temptation, right? Like there, there, there is no greater truth that I have learned from uh, from one of my favorite uh, authors and Mark Twain, which then that the more you know, the more you know you don't know, right? The horizons of intelligence are always receding, right? And so, the you know the humility that comes with constantly seeking, constantly believing there's more out there, constantly believing that you're not that smart, right? That your your work is not done, right? That you're like, I, I, you know, 
academics suffer in a, to a great degree from a sense of their limitations exactly because they know so much, right? Like that the more you know, the more you are aware of just how much, not just as an individual, but as in a society, we still haven't got, right? Uh, and that I think is, you know, something to hold on to, right? We, you're going to have these moments like graduation where the temptation is to say, this part of my life is over, that my education is done, right? It's not, right? It's always got to be self-directed. Like if, if we're teaching you anything, it's the skill to be able after that point to know what to do to answer your questions for yourself, right? To keep doing that seeking. I like the art person. Yeah, Jan's <laughs> actually participated. Yeah. Um, well, I I would be what uh, Derek has proposed with this artist. Like, if you can do something with nature, I would do that. Um, I think why there's murals. It, it's uh, you can see a mural all year. We live in a, a climate that you can only have flowers from what, May to October or whatever. So a mural lasts all year. So I don't have anything against the mural from, from that standpoint. One of the things that I was gonna say though, is that I believe that we should pay more attention to local art uh, because the, the art world, the fashion world is one of the biggest uh, abusers of energy uh, because we're so global hmm. and we don't think anything of getting in a plane and going to the Venice Biennale or wherever. Uh, instead of thinking we have to go really far away to see something mm -hmm. or to buy something from somebody, we have to go to, you know, even if it's like Seattle or something, I mean, why not look locally first, support local artists? Um, to me, that's a, a positive thing. And, um, you know, I, it's that biblical thing, you know, about Jesus, you know, the, the prophet isn't appreciated by his own people, you know, he has to go elsewhere and then people think he's great. Uh, and I feel like that's what happens with local artists often, that, you know, they, they are appreciated somewhere else and all of a sudden people <laughs> like them, but that's really blind. I mean, we've been talking about how we, we have these sort of tunnel vision about, we think we know. And uh, I think that's one of the worst things in this, in our society is that we don't appreciate local artisans. I, I mean, Derek has got a really beautiful uh, pieces down at the roundabout that he, mm -hmm. I photographed him uh, like on an evening, like the sun was setting and he was in freezing weather and his winter coat and he had a drill and he was making these really beautiful fish shapes. That artwork is about New York State, about fishing. You know, it's it's a. Um, I didn't have to go to Paris. You know, I I can walk down to that roundabout and get close, and I can actually know the artist. So I I would just like to see more of that kind of thing because I think that is a way to be more positive about using resources. I think recycling is is the most um, important thing that we all should do. And it's not just to recycle as art objects, but as, as Derek talked about clothing, uh, clothing is uh, something that can be refashioned, you know, learn, learn the skill of sewing with Martha Easton, term three. Um, I think that would go far to helping our, our environment. If I can just sort of extrapolate that out to just say, be skeptical of hierarchies of scale, right? It's really, really tempting in, you know, our highly interconnected mass culture, right? Global society to feel as though things that aren't, you know, that don't explode through the mass culture aren't worthwhile, right? And that's a really dangerous thing to assume, and especially, I mean, a lot of us are getting kind of metricized, right? Like we, you know, how many likes did we get, right? How many followers do we have? Those kinds of things. Like it, it tends to habituate you to hierarchies of scale, right? That things that, that things that aren't big, right, are less worthwhile. That's really a dangerous habit to get into, the local, right? Things that, you know, you might be part of a subculture, right? You maybe, you know, are reading a, a collection 
collection of poetry that only a hundred people or other people are reading. That doesn't mean it's not valuable, right? Don't, you know, don't get, get caught up in the presumption that something has to explode into a larger framework in order for it to be usable for you, right? Oftentimes the things that are most useful for you may only be useful for a few other people, right? Look, don't, don't hesitate, right? To, to take that advantage, right? It must be taught. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.